So this is an unscripted video of me talking about movies I saw in 2017. Because it's unscripted, there's going to be a lot of ums and buts and me saying like. And if you take a shot every time I say wonderful or awful, I think it is wonderful. But this movie is awful. Ungodly awful. A completely forgettable awful movie. And it's awful. You're going to die, so just know that going into this video. Anyway, enjoy. Ma 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 ma. Ba 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 ba. Sally sells she the Sally sells she oh. Sally sells what does Sally sell? This was a great year for movies, not even kidding. So this is interesting because I get to talk about good movies for once, which is like oh god, how rare that is. I mean, I'd like to talk about good movies more this year, you know? Here's Ralph's New Year's resolution, everybody. I'm gonna talk about more good movies this year, all right? Fuck you, Ralph, we want to see you suffer. Unsubscribe. Oh, the subscriber count went down. All right, I'll, I'll just talk about bad movies. Chips review coming right up. Emoji movie review coming right up. Despicable Me 3 review coming right up. So first of all, I want to say I'm so sorry to all the foreign movies and really, really indie movies I have not seen because I really do like to see as many movies as possible before I make this list. Uh, the Square and Happy End in particular, I really wanted to see because The Square looked great and Happy End is uh, Michael Haneke, who I love, but that's not gonna happen. I have seen 71 movies this year that came out this year, not counting the ones that came out in other years. And I've watched one, two, three, five, eight, nine television shows. If you wanna have a list of everything I've seen, um, it's on IMDb, I'm gonna put the link in the description, right? And if I see anything from this year later on that I thought was, you know, good, I'm gonna put it on the list. Right? And you can just chuck that. <laughs> Number 20, we got Molly's Game. This is from writer, director, Aaron Sorkin. This is the first film he has directed. And the worst thing about this film is the fact that he directed it. He is, he's a competent director, but I was picturing a Danny Boyle or a David Fincher who can just really elevate Aaron Sorkin's material. Because Aaron Sorkin is a terrific writer, right? And not only is his direction not up to snuff with these legends, I think this is probably the weakest script he's written. Um, you, you, you definitely see the formula now. You see how he kind of structures all of his movies basically the same. And not only do you see that formula, and not only am I tired of him just adapting true stories and putting his little mark on it, but I think the third act of this movie it resolves itself a little too cleanly, and I know that's what happened in real life. But there's like a scene where Kevin Costner's like, I'm gonna give you a therapy session in three minutes and we're gonna work out every piece of emotional baggage. I doubt that happened in real life. Um, for the most part though, I think this movie works. I think the performances are terrific. The poker scenes in this movie though, that's absolutely the highlight. So in terms of Aaron Sorkin's material, it's, I don't think it's anything special. It's probably one of his lesser things he's done. But even so, it's incredibly well-written and, and funny and witty and fast-paced. And I, I criticize his direction, right? But this is a really well-paced, slick movie. And I didn't really have any major problems with it until the last third or so. Number 19, we got Ingrid Goes West. This film is about a, a crazy bitch who falls in love, <laughs> not really falls in love, not in a romantic kind of way, you know, in like a fangirl kind of way, falls in love with Elizabeth Olsen's character over Instagram. And from there, she goes to LA, hunts her down, and does anything she possibly can to become friends with this girl. And it's a really interesting comment on internet fame and, and fandom. And it made me absolutely horrified of you people you fans out there. I mean, this is the problem I've always had with fandom, that, that some of you are just, obviously 98% of you are great, but, but, but there's like 2% of you that are completely fucking nuts, right? Because the, the whole movie kicks off basically because Audrey Plaza is just a lonely, miserable person and lives alone. And Elizabeth Olsen responds to a comment she left on one of her pictures and then Audrey Plaza thinks they're friends. So besides this like really creepy premise that relates to me a lot, and I found very engaging, 
you got terrific performances from Audrey Plaza and Elizabeth Olsen and O'Shea Jackson Jr. He has so much charisma throughout this entire thing and he has he's the heart of this movie basically because what you're dealing with otherwise are two shallow miserable people and O'Shea Jackson's just in the middle you know trying to get everyone to like liven up and be friendly. This movie is it, it exists in a heightened reality which I was fine with but I think toward the the last act of this movie Kind of like Molly's game, everything kind of falls apart, not completely. I like the way it ended in theory, this. Obviously, I'm not going to spoil it for you. But once you get to that point, right, in the movie, because I, I highly recommend you watch this, regardless of the complaints I have. Um, it gets to this point, toward the very, very end, where I like where they went with it, right? But they could have done that better in, in execution. As it is right now in the movie, it feels a little rushed that the, this whole like revelation takes place in basically two minutes in a bed. There's there's a kidnap scene which I thought was completely ridiculous and kind of poorly done. But the rest of this movie, it looks great. The lighting is fantastic. There's this scene by the pool where they're they're lit by like the the pool light. A really really good movie that's just like a hair away from being great. I kind of saw Raw before it blew up, so I just watched it as like, oh, I heard this is an interesting little festival thing. And I saw it and I very much enjoyed it. It's not perfect. For one thing, I, I've seen it, I think, I saw it like one and a half times, and I don't really remember much about it. I remember certain scenes, like when she's pulling hair out of her mouth, and like when they're digging into a cow's ass. I think the movie's kind of over the top, and I didn't really find the story itself all that engaging, but that being said, I think this film is wonderful. It's a really effective, fucked up movie, basically because of the filmmaking. There's this amazing set piece where our lead character, who's played by Garance Mowry er but there's this amazing set piece where she's going through this party and it's all done in one take and there's like dozens of extras. It's in, it's so well done. There isn't much room to get bored and while I didn't find the story all that compelling and kind of ridiculous, and I also didn't think any of the performances were all that like incredible or stand out, but what really makes it here is the filmmaking. Julia whatever, Duh, buh, 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 wrote the screenplay as well, so she clearly had a vision and knew what she wanted to do. And she did it very, very effectively. Number 17, we got Get Out. The worst thing about this movie is the filmmaking. It's it's an odd it's an odd trade-off, right? Because all of the characters are extremely funny, even the ones that are supposed to be more intimidating. They they bring out either nervous laughter or just straight up laughter. In a lesser movie, that sidekick character, the guy who's a cop would be an awful character and would be incredibly annoying. But Jordan Peele knows how to make that character entertaining and funny. And even though throughout most of this movie, he's on the sidelines not doing anything to do with the plot, you still enjoy when they cut back to him. So Jordan Peele really excels at comedy. I've made that clear. But I, I would have liked to see this movie made by a horror director. Because as a horror movie, I don't think it's nearly as effective as it wants to be. This movie kind of looks like a TV show. Like I would have liked I would have just loved like a grainy dark looking movie just to add to that paranoia and that claustrophobia. But it, it all looks like digital and it's all overlit. I also found the plot incredibly predictable. Obviously the trailers didn't help because they gave away most of the plot, but it's basically Wicker Man except instead of luring in men to burn them to sacrifice them to the bees. They lure in a black guy and sacrifice people. Oh, I'm spoiling it. I'm so sorry. I got John Wick Chapter 2. Okay. So, yeah, objectivity, right? I try to be objective with movies, right? Technical merit. A movie, a movie that's an Oscar movie, I, I'm like, wow, so much technical merit. But then you see a movie like John Wick, right? And, and that testosterone part of me goes like... Fuck yeah! I know, in theory, there are better movies than John Wick 2. I know the plot of John Wick 2 is the dumbest shit. I know Keanu Reeves can't act, but as a guy who likes action movies, this movie is awesome, okay? This is the coolest movie 
The fight choreography is wonderful. The action scenes are terrific. Some of the best action scenes I've seen in forever. This is one of the best action movies, period, I've seen since The Raid 2. Keanu Reeves, I know he can't act, but here's the thing, right? You have- you surround Keanu Reeves with all of these terrific actors. Ian McShane, Ricardo Scamarchio, who plays the Italian guy, Maron. You surround him with like these Oscar-winning, Emmy-winning actors, and they elevate him to make him like at least decent. Then you got a character like John Wick, who Keanu Reeves really doesn't have to talk all that much. And when he does, you're like, yeah, he sucks, right? But you always buy him as John Wick. He is John Wick, much like how Gal Gadot's not a good actress, but you buy her as Wonder Woman. Uh, Keanu Reeves can't act, but you buy him as John Wick. He's just awesome. I, I love the blunt simplicity of John Wick, where he will, he doesn't talk, he doesn't negotiate. If you mess with him, he kills you. It's as simple as that. And he'll shoot you in the head. If he shoots you three times in the chest, he'll shoot you again in the head just to make sure you're dead. That's the kind of blunt guy he is, and I love that. I think that's awesome. The world of John Wick, this world of assassins that are like, they all trade each other currency, and obviously it doesn't make any sense because according to the movie, basically half the population of the planet is are assassins. It's such an interesting world to set this movie in, and it's, it's just, it's cool. Thank God it's not all up close, shaky cam. There's lots of wide shots, there's lots of long takes because you have actors and actresses who can actually fight. You know, it's a Valentine's Day movie and if the girl gets to pick, that you go see Fifty Shades of Grey. And if the guy gets to pick, you get to see John Wick. And, at, and in that context, John Wick is the best movie ever made. Number 15, we have Logan, which I criticized for being a complete ripoff of Children of Men. Um, which it is, right? But that being said, I have no other complaints with it, really. I think some of the CGI is a little weird. I think some of the music's a little weird. But aside from that really predictable story, which is basically Children of Men retold, what you have is a really mature, different superhero movie. You have characters dealing with mature themes. It's not just, we gotta save the planet. It's about, it's about death. The whole theme of this movie is basically death and overcoming death and learning to deal with it. It's just a miserable movie. In a good way. Hugh Jackman given the performance of his life. Patrick Stewart is so good in this movie. And I love the way this movie sets itself, uh, frames itself outside of this comic book universe as if everything we've seen in this X-Men franchise has been a, a, an exaggerated retelling of real events that occur in the world of Logan. You got the comic books, right, with the Statue of Liberty and the, all this ridiculous shit. And then Logan goes, yeah, that happened, but it didn't happen like that. Because in the real world, that's not how shit happens. So it works as a great Western, it works as a great superhero movie. It's very unique. I can go into depth with like all the problems I have with it, which are mostly nitpicks that are scattered throughout that kind of keep this movie from being, you know, a masterpiece. But I don't want to knock this movie, really, because I just thought it was refreshing. It was a great end to this chapter of superhero movies, to, to Logan, to Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, to Patrick Stewart as Professor X. I love that Logan was dark as hell, and I think we definitely needed that. But that being said, Spider-Man Homecoming is the complete opposite. It's basically a comedy. If you ask me, it's in the same genre as uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I think it's more of a movie like that than a Marvel movie. But Homecoming, as a fan of Spider-Man, since I was a little boy, a little young lad, I've been a fan of Spider-Man. And seeing this new take on Spider-Man that's funny and clever and original and creative. And I put it on again thinking I was going to watch some of it, and I ended up watching the whole thing from start to end. It did everything it had to, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. 13 is Call Me By Your Name. I thought this film was absolutely wonderful. This, it's hard to even criticize a movie like this because when you're watching it, and again, I recommend you watch it. So when you watch it, you're gonna see it's not even like watching a movie. It's literally watching two guys form a relationship and that's it. That's the whole movie. There's no plot, there's no like acts really. I mean, there's a loose framework. This movie has a structure, of course, but it's very loose 
and it really takes its time at 132 minutes. Army Hammer plays like a 23 year old, I think he's supposed to be 23 in the movie, a uh, like college student who's helping uh, a professor who's the father of this kid who's 17 and of course discovering his homosexuality or whatever. And But an excellent thing about this movie is that the fact that they're gay is basically incidental. Obviously there's a little bit in there, but it's more in the framework of a kid growing up and discovering himself. It never devolves into this dumb, simple, stupid movie where like the parents walk in on them having sex and the mom goes, oh, I can't believe my kid is gay. Or the kid feeling ashamed at the fact that he is gay. Like it could have been a straight relationship and it basically would have been the same movie, almost. No one ever demeans the relationship or treats it as if it's like a bad thing. The parents aren't like, oh, you're gay. We're gonna institutionalize you. They just treat it. They're like, yeah, all right, whatever. And there's nothing to distract it from just a movie about two guys falling in love with each other. One of them is young and naive, so he kind of overvalues how much it really means to the other guy. The other guy is like an older college student who's there for a summer, and he's like, you know what, I'm gonna have fun with this young kid. I like him a lot, but then I'm gonna go home. He's way more mature about it, but it, like, you're, you're more invested in this, the dynamic between these two people more so than any kind of plot or, you know, are the parents gonna find out? Is his girlfriend gonna find out? Because that's not what this movie's about at all. And, you know, no disrespect to a movie like Moonlight, because Moonlight deals with these themes in, in a different way, in a more dramatic way. And I think Moonlight's a much better movie than this, for that reason. But seeing two gay guys just fall in love in a movie that's almost three hours long, and, and it's, it feels almost improvisational, it feels like you're watching real life, I think that's a huge achievement. And it was very different, and I thoroughly enjoyed this movie, and I highly recommend it. We got Bad Genius at number 12. None of you have any idea what this is. It's a movie from Thailand, I believe. So, so basically the only problems I have with this is a lost in translation kind of thing, where movies from Thailand are very... Of course, I'm not speaking on behalf of every movie made in Thailand. That would be racist. But, but movies made in Thailand and other countries sometimes are very over the top, they have lots of like ridiculous shots and, and ridiculous sound effects like <laughs> camera angles that like speed up and slow down, right? It's like early 2000s level corny shit. And also you got like the fact that people speak English in this movie. There are American or at least uh, British characters in it or Australian characters in it that, that speak English. And as someone who speaks English, I'm like, wow, their acting is awful. And of course, the guys from Thailand don't know that because they don't speak English and they just see a guy going ba 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 and they're like, oh, that's fine. So what you have to accept watching this movie is that anyone who speaks English is a bad actor. It's completely over the top, not just in terms of the story itself, but in the way it's executed with ridiculous sound effects and music. Once you put all that aside and you completely engross yourself in the world of this movie that it sets up, it's, it's terrific young kids who want to go to America and the only way to get to America is to do these you know uh, international scholarships you have to do really well on tests there's and so there's one really smart girl and they all want to copy off of her so they construct these elaborate ways of, of cheating it's basically a heist movie except these kids are cheating on tests instead of stealing money and it's so different and creative and funny and fast-paced and intense. The end of this movie is just one long cheating session where they have to go to Sydney, Australia so that they can take a test and memorize the answers and then go to the toilet and have these phones where they text the answers to the people who are taking the, the test over in Thailand so they can cheat on the test. And they have to time it perfectly and they have to memorize all the answers. It's like, oh my god, are they gonna do it? and they keep raising the stakes more and more and more as the film goes on. And it's like, it's beautiful. It really is this perfect ballet of just crazy, crazy shit. And you have really great characters and performances in this movie as well. The lead actress is terrific. And then you got this character, oh, I forgot his name. It's like Tank or Bank or something. Breck. Onions have lands. He dances my swamp. Onions have lands. He dances my swamp. Onions have lands. He dances my. 
Bank. Okay, so his name is Bank, played by Chanon Santi Nat. <laughs> no, fuck me. Oh my god, I thought the French names were bad. Well, her name in the movie is Lin, but the actress's name is Chutiman Ching Chowin Suk Yang. They're all relatively simple characters. Obviously, they go through things, they go through arcs. And Bank becomes a very different character toward the end of the movie than he is at the beginning. He's personally my favorite character in the whole movie. But you get to really know these kids and like them within just a couple scenes. You get their dynamic, and it's, it's, it really is an achievement. And if it wasn't for that Lost in Translation uh, thing, I, I think this movie would have been a 10 out of 10, honestly. I thoroughly enjoy this movie. I will watch this with basically everyone I know, because I know they'll enjoy it. And I know you'll enjoy it as well, once you put aside the the ridiculous nature of it. Number 11, we have Okja, which is a film by Jun Ho Bong, the guy who made Snowpiercer, which is an excellent movie as well. Okja, another terrific movie, basically uh, an allegory for um, how we farm animals and kill them. This movie kind of emotionally manipulates you into identifying with a uh, basically a pig that has more intelligence and, and a uh, human-like traits than a normal pig. But really what this film is about is a girl who wants to get her pig back. And I won't say much more about it besides that. At first I thought this was a kid's movie, but then Tilda Swinton says fuck, and I'm like, okay, that's this is not a kid's movie. Tilda Swinton, I want to add by the way, is excellent in this movie, as she is in Snowpiercer. The only issues I have with it are, um, again, it's kind of manipulative. Obviously, in real life, pigs and farm animals are not nearly as intelligent as as Okja, the pig in this movie. Like, yeah, I felt bad for the pig in the movie, but immediately after I saw the movie, I ate a burger and a steak and a piece of chicken. I didn't give a shit. So aside from that, I think the CG on the pig itself, most of the time it looks decent, sometimes it looks a little bad. I think Jake Gyllenhaal is not very good in this movie. Tilda Swinton is over the top in this movie, but Jake Gyllenhaal cranks it to 11. He goes full retard, and you never go full retard. He needed to tone it way down for this. Number 10, you got Baby Driver. I am shocked this made it on the list, honestly. Because at first, when I first saw this movie, I'm like, yeah, it's decent. But it's really grown on me, and I, I understand what I don't like about this movie now, okay? And it's basically the last 20 minutes. Last 20 minutes is where everything goes wrong. The last chase scene in the movie is not nearly as exciting as the rest of them. Um, the, the plot kind of gets mixed up and tangled, and Edgar Wright doesn't know what to do with any of these threads, so he's just like, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll just end it like this, and it's very unsatisfying. Um, I don't like the last five minutes where it shows baby and I, I, I thought the girlfriend character was okay up to that point, to where she goes, okay, baby, I'll go with you, even though you're like... Baby is a criminal, why would you go with him? So you got this last piece of this movie that's not very good. I mean, it's not awful, but it's not as good as the rest of it. And it also completely loses the gimmick, which made the movie so exciting, which is that everything syncs up to music. It loses that completely. There's 90% of this movie that is basically perfect. The chase scenes are exciting, the performances are great, uh, a Jamie Foxx, I don't know why anyone complains that he's bad in this movie, I think he's one of the best parts of it. So yeah, you got a really fun, exciting heist movie that doesn't, um, in terms of story, bring anything, it doesn't bring anything new to the table. But in terms of execution, you've got Edgar Wright, who's just talent. He's raw talent. And he can take all these things that really don't mesh and work together and make them work as well as they do. Uh, some, some of the best car chases I've seen in forever. And the more I watch it, the more jokes I catch on to, and the more I get to admire how how hard he worked to make sure these these action sequences sync with the uh, the music he's playing. Number nine, you got Shape of Water, a uh, wonderful movie. And there's a character, the general character, who is he's awful. He's such a bad character, and whenever he's on screen, I'm just like, oh my god. And he has like lines like, "You see these stars, son." That means I I have order over you. In the end, it's my decision. Not that the rest of these characters are, like, subtle in any way. But they work in this kind of adult fantasy world Guillermo has created. Sally Hawkins, she's mute. And she doesn't say a word of dialogue at all through the whole movie. Except in one little dream sequence. And yet she's very compelling and interesting. 
and likable. And that's a huge feat to pull off as an actress. Uh, Octavia Spencer is a great comedic relief. Michael Shannon, I love Michael Shannon more than life itself. And he is so good in this movie. Portrayed by any other actor, like an actor like, let's say, the guy who played the general, he would be an awful character. He would be completely over the top and evil and irredeemable. But Michael Shannon finds a way to make him pathetic. Like, he's not evil. He's just... He lacks confidence. He has no power over anyone. Uh, his family thinks he's weird. His boss doesn't like him. And the only way he can get any of this rage and insecurity out is, is on this random creature by torturing it. And that's ultimately what this movie's about. Aside from all the, you know, spectacular visuals and, you know, creature effects, it's a movie about a bunch of misfits and outcasts. Uh, a black woman, a mute, and you got Michael Shannon, who's weird. You got Richard Jenkins, who's gay. And then you got Michael St uh, Stolberg, who's a Russian spy. Um, but he doesn't really like the Russians, and the only reason he's with them is so he has an excuse to study this creature because he loves science. And the Americans want him to kill it. So he's kind of in the middle of the American side and the Russian side. So all these misfits take their insecurities and put it on this creature, basically. I saw this movie, and then the day after, I went back to the theater and saw it again. I thought it was that good. I think the ending's a little eh, but you, they put that in a context where you can kind of go, oh, okay, that didn't really happen, maybe. So that's how I see it. But yeah, it's, it's a wonderful little adult fairy tale. Number eight, we got Dunkirk. This is Anxiety Attack, the movie. That's all this is. There's not really a story. There's not really any characters. You are. It's a visual experience where you sit there and you watch chaos for an hour and a half. Basically, the only way to watch it is in a theater. Legit, the only way to watch it. I saw it on uh, DVD a couple weeks ago, and it's not nearly as good. It's not even close to as good. The characters, there are no characters. That's the thing. That, that's why this movie is so great, is it doesn't get bogged down in the minutia of, let's, let's have scenes where people go, you know, back home, I got a mom, and I have a wife, and I, ha I have two kids at home that I need to get back to. And there's none of that awful time-wasting bullshit in this movie where people feel bad for themselves or talk about how they have to go home to their kids. Everyone's too fucking busy trying to stay alive. Like, they don't even have time to talk to each other because right when they start to, they look up and there's like eight bombers coming in and they got like, take cover. Chris Nolan puts enough faith in you as the audience to go, you know this guy is 17. He probably has a mom and maybe a brother and a, and a dad. And then you got Tom Hardy in his plane and you see a picture of his family like off to the side and you're like, okay, he's got a family at home. And you got the same, th uh, Killian Murphy has a wedding ring on. You're like, okay, he's married. And that's all you need. Like, you don't need to waste time with this garbage because these characters are not even remotely worried about their family or anything given the situation they're in. They are worried about dying. And they don't have time to waste to talk about nonsense. They need to get out of the situation as soon as possible. And they do shitty things to each other to ensure that they get out as quickly as possible. We don't even see German soldiers throughout the whole movie. We see like three or four toward the end and they're out of focus in the background. Because this movie is not about the Nazis coming in. It's about a bunch of people stuck in a horrible situation and what they do to each other. They're like rats. They just they eat each other alive if they have to. The issues are with this movie, it's not really rewatchable. Once you see it once or twice, you get the gist of it. You're like, okay, that's it. I know what happens now, so it's not nearly as exciting. It, and I think the sound mixing's a little off. I think sometimes the music's too loud. I think the the dialogue is barely audible throughout most of it. And luckily, that's not that big of a thing, because like dialogue in this movie is not important at all. But like 80% of the dialogue, I couldn't, I couldn't understand what anyone was saying. It's such an ambitious, well-made project. I, it's, it's up there with one of Nolan's best movies for me. It's been so long that it is now nighttime, and I haven't even gotten through the top 10 yet. Oh boy, uh, so many movies to go. Mother is a nightmare. It's a wonderful nightmare. It, is, it isn't very subtle. It's very in-your-face and kind of obnoxious and... Um, there's, there's stuff that can be trimmed out, and it's a little pretentious here and there. Um, 
I, I have some legit complaints with this movie, and I totally understand why people do not like it. But I, from start to end, was completely riveted by this movie. I thought it was spectacular. For the last half hour of this movie, my jaw was on the floor. And not many movies make me do that. So that is an achievement in and of itself, right? But you also have great performances from basically everyone. This movie is terrifically directed. Darren Aronofsky knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly where to put the camera and how long to keep it there. It makes you feel claustrophobic and nervous constantly. The buildup to the more ridiculous stuff that happens later on is terrific because at first this movie is very grounded and believable it feels like it could be set in the real world but then you slowly notice things start going are like off you're like why is this house just alone in this random field and there's like nothing around it how come we're never leaving this house then more people start showing up and it gets a little ridiculous and then it gets to the point where it's just insanity Despite being a very flawed film, I think it's very effective. And I also want to mention the fact that the first time I saw this movie, I, I am not a religious person, as many of you know. I, I am a Scientologist. That's my that's my official religion. So so I don't know anything about the Bible. So when I first saw this movie, I didn't see any of the Bible connections. I just saw it as like a metaphor for marriage and being married to an artist and, and like a relationship falling apart, right? That's how I saw it. And of course, upon watching it again, I see the, the religious parallels now that they've been pointed out to me. First of all, Aronofsky constructed this movie in such a way where you do not need to know any of that to enjoy it. Um, but once you do, it enlightens you a little bit. And I think it goes beyond just a, being a retelling of the Bible. I don't think it's just a literal retelling of the Bible. It's saying, it's, it's using the framework of the Bible as a backdrop for this story between a, a couple. And I think it's kind of, I think the point of the movie is kind of a mix between my thing, a relationship, and uh, the religious symbolism in it. Regardless though, this is a, this is a damn interesting movie, and there's nothing else like it, and knowing the reception it got, and the fact that it didn't make money, there will never be a movie like it again. Six, we got Blade Runner 2049. For many people, this should be higher on the list. The reason it isn't for me is, um, Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049, both of these movies, uh, the plot is secondary to the world. This movie's all about the world. Blade Runner, the original one, is all about the world of it. And the plot is fine. But then, And this one, granted, it's a bit more interesting than Blade Runner, the original. But it's not quite there for me. This movie is a bit too long. Uh, it could, it felt more like I was watching a director's cut. And it's not so much that you can cut scenes out, because basically every scene needs to be there. It's more that every scene goes on for too long. And there's plot holes in it too, and there's like things I was like, what? And why does Jared Leto want a baby born from a, a, a replicant? Doesn't that ruin his entire business model if just replicants can reproduce with each other? Why would he want that? That's where my issues start and end with it. Now, I know the Oscars are completely comprised of hacks, but if Roger Deakins does not win Best Cinematography, like, I, I'm not even going to take it seriously anymore. Like, that's proof. He has constructed one of the most gorgeous-looking movies ever made. Just the sets, the, the fucking cut, the production design of everything. It, the world itself is so beautiful, you can't help but just stand in awe. That's where this movie really shines. Not that any of the other elements are bad, because the performances are wonderful. The script is decent, of course. And the sci-fi concepts that this movie explores, even though they're a little reminiscent of other movies like Her, and um, Ex Machina, and just, I don't know, I could, I could name a bunch of other things. But it does something new with it. Number five, we have The Killing of a Sacred Deer. So this movie is made by Yorgos Lanthimos. Is that how you say his name? These names are killing me. He made this movie The Lobster, which is absolutely wonderful. I like The Lobster better than Killing of a Sacred Deer because the, the dark comedy in The Lobster is just brilliant. And the acting in The Lobster is very wooden and stilted, but that's done intentionally to show a, a world where everyone is very emotionless. Uh, to Again, just to add to the comedy, right? In this movie, Yorgos does the same thing. He constructs a world that's kind of real life, but everyone acts like a weird robot. 
I think for this movie, that doesn't work nearly as well as it does for the lobster, nor do I really understand the point of doing that. I don't get what point you're trying to get across by having everyone act like weird. To me, this would have been a more effective movie if all the main characters in it acted like just real people. Some of these say shit and do shit that's so dumb, like Colin Firth's whole spiel about how he jerked off his father. It was like ridiculous. It, it's trying too hard sometimes, and it's like Yorgos is trying to be an edgelord. And you know, the lobster was much better in terms of dark comedy than this was. That's my only real problem with this movie, because um, it's it's so disturbing and creepy. I highly recommend this movie. I'm not going to say a damn thing about it, plot-wise. Just that, be prepared for a really interesting, different film. And Nicole Kidman, shout out to Nicole Kidman in this. She's phenomenal. But then we got Barry Keoghan. He's, he's the by far the best actor in this movie, and he has the most humanity, oddly enough, because he acts like a weirdo. But And e everyone in this movie acts like a weirdo, so that really makes him just shine. It's like, at least he's a weirdo, yeah, but at least he's acting more human than the rest of these weirdos. Number four, we have Phantom Thread by Paul Thomas Anderson, one of the best filmmakers working today. His only misstep is Inherent Vice, which is so awful, it's like he didn't even make it. Thank God he's back to form now, and he made um, a really, really interesting love story that you're gonna. I, I'm not sure how you're gonna react to it, but I highly recommend it. I'm not gonna say a damn thing about it. The acting is terrific, not only from Daniel Day Lewis, who is obviously like he's the best actor, but you got Vicky Cripes, who's great. I think that's how you say it. Leslie Manfield as the sister is wonderful. And although you might be expecting like a really dark love story that's like creepy, it's a really funny movie on top of it. Daniel Day-Lewis hates like when people make lots of noise when they eat, and when she makes noise while like during the breakfast scenes, Daniel Day-Lewis is like the- just the looks he gives are fucking hilarious. The chemistry Daniel Day-Lewis and Paul Thomas Anderson have, like it, their work relationship, it's impeccable. There's a scene in this movie where Daniel Day-Lewis is eating an omelet, and it's like one of the most riveting things I've ever seen. The score is beautiful. The best, I think the best score of the year. I love Paul Thomas Anderson. He's such a smart filmmaker, and he knows exactly what he's doing. And I can't wait to see this movie again. Number three is It Comes at Night, a sad, depressing, riveting movie about paranoia. Trey Edward Schultz, sadly, he's he's uh, his marketing people sold this as a horror movie, which it isn't really. It's more of a thriller about a bunch of people in the post-apocalypse who are in a house, but and it becomes not about the horrors of what's outside. It's about the horrors of what's inside. Not only the house, but in the human mind. It's a wonderful movie about paranoia. The way it uses point of view as a device to just create this layer of suspense, because you you you're always in the point of view of the the initial family you meet, and not this other family, and you you never get their point of view. You only see them from the point of view of our characters, really, for the most part. And so you're just like, what are these people up to? There has to be something up with them. They're definitely lying, right? And you become part of the situation where you're like, what's everyone up to? What's going on here? They never say what the disease is that's outside. They never say, like, how far this disease is spread. They never say where this movie takes place. It's just a forest in the middle of this post-apocalyptic world. What's the virus? I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's not important for this story. Because the ultimate virus is paranoia. And everyone gets it. How fitting would it be if Three Billboards was number three? Three Billboards is an excellent movie. It's it, it was nice to watch a movie that felt like it was written by a human being. Everyone involved with this movie brought their A-game. All of the performances are terrific. Francis McDormand, Woody Harrelson, Sam Rockwell. But the star of this movie is, of course, the writer-director Martin McDonough, who has crafted a brilliant story about revenge and how revenge just begets greater revenge and more violence. I really enjoyed Martin McDonough's previous movies in Bruges and Seven Psychopaths. Uh, very different movies. But this one is just, it's a masterpiece. I've only seen it once, which is why I'm going to give it a 9 for now. But I could end up seeing this more times, and um, maybe we'll get a 10. Who knows? But for me, my only 10 out of 10 movie this year 
the best movie of the year. It's been a long time. I can't wait to tell you guys about this movie. It's called Good Time. Good Time is literally a perfect movie. There's, there's, um, not literally perfect. The punches don't look all that real, right? But that's it. So let's talk about the technical aspects of this movie first, right? There's lots of close-ups, lots of uh, handheld, lots of quick cutting, and that works really well for this movie because it sets up that environment and the tone of this movie beautifully. This raw, gritty tone that I love so much. And as if that's not enough, I'm from Queens, and the level of authenticity the, the set designers bring to this world, the cinematography and lighting bring to this world, the actors bring to this world, it's beautiful to see an environment I'm so familiar with be, be done so well. And I can't even picture this movie being shot any other way than the way it is. The performances here are fantastic. The director, Benny Safdie, is the retarded brother in the film. And I swear to God, watching it the first time, I thought they just got a retarded guy to play this character. He's so good, and then you have Robert Pattinson, who's like from freaking Britain or something. And he... I, I was like, oh my God, is he from Queens? And all the performances here, Jennifer Jason Lee. Uh, there's this uh, Talia, what's her name? Talia Webster, I believe she plays the younger girl in the movie. Buddy Duress as Ray, right? This character who literally comes out of nowhere in the middle of this movie. And he, he steals it. And literally the next thing I remember is I'm fucking, I'm running down some random street and I just see a fucking cab and I hail it and I just get in. Like, I know people like this. It's this emotional roller coaster, and at the center of it all, and at the center of all these, like, has-been characters, is this main character, Connie, played by Robert Pattinson, who gets his brother into this horrible situation, and is only trying to fix it, and he fixes it throughout the course of this movie. He tries and tries and tries, and it only gets worse. He has this idea of himself that he's this important individual, and that his life means something, and that he's gonna save the day. But the movie, he slowly realizes, he's like, I'm a loser. And all I've done is hurt everyone around me. Not just my family, but my, my friends, the people I met here at night, my girlfriend. I've ruined everything. But the only reason you root for him is because he loves his brother so much he's willing to do anything for him. And you care about his brother because his brother's retarded and he doesn't know what he's doing. And like, he helps Connie do all these bad things at the start of the movie, but the brother doesn't know any better. And in any other movie, this could not work at all, right? Because you could not buy Nick as a character or not like Nick as a character, but you do. And so even though Nick is only in this movie for the first 20 minutes and then the last five minutes, you're like, I, I really want this guy to get out okay. So I'll go along with Connie on this adventure. It has no plot. It has no uh, three-act structure or anything like that. It's just a series of scenes of this guy trying to get his brother out of jail. So you have no idea where it's going, when it's gonna end, how it's gonna end, and it's, it rides this beautiful fine line between tragedy and comedy. It's full of heart and authenticity, and it's so beautifully made. The score is mwah. Every aspect of this movie is so well done, and, and they, they paid so much attention to detail to make sure every piece of it works. And in anyone else's hands, this movie can fall completely flat. Everyone has a character. Jennifer Jason Lee is literally in this movie for five minutes, and she makes such an impact. Even the drug dealer friend, uh, Khalif, he's a great character, and he's in it for five minutes. I cannot recommend this movie enough. If I had to recommend one movie to you this year, this is it. There is not a low point at all in this movie from start to end, and it's just, uh, just adrenaline. All right, so let's talk about some TV shows quick. Um, House of Cards sucked this year. This was just an awful season that just got rid of everything I like about House of Cards, and it becomes less about uh, Claire and Frank Underwood, and becomes more about these random side characters that, were, that are barely developed and you don't like at all. And now that Kevin Spacey is gone, you know, in this show, and it's just about Claire Underwood, I mean, I hate to say it because Kevin Spacey's a total creep, right? But Kevin Spacey, he makes the show. Him and Claire, Robin Wright, make the show. The show is about the dynamic between those two. When you get rid of one of them, like, what else is there? Game of Thrones, I did a video on that. Not a great season. Uh, Stranger Things, I like Stranger Things as a family show. I think for families, 
it's great, like anyone from the age of 6 to the age of uh, 88, let's just say 88, I think if you're 89 you're not going to like this show, but if you're 88 you'll like it. Anyone in that age range can basically find something to enjoy in it. Better Call Saul, another really wonderful season of uh, Vince Gilligan's new show. No Breaking Bad, but what is? Legion, this was a really weird experimental show. Uh, I've never seen a superhero show like this, which is why I decided to watch the whole thing. The quality ranges from being god-awful to being really fantastic. So if you're willing to put up with some pretentious bullshit and some weird moments that are just awful, uh, you, can, you can get around it and enjoy this show. Big Little Lies, this was sold to me as a murder mystery, and it ended up being like a, a chick flick, like Sex in the City. And the murder mystery ended up being the least interesting part of it. The most interesting part of it was just watching these three women and their lives, and how they, and not just these three women, every woman in the show, how they, they put on this facade that their lives are great, but then inside is like this really twisted, dark thing. They all have their thing, and they're, they're all incredibly flawed people, the performances are great, the writing is excellent, the directing, it's the guy who made Dallas Buyers Club and the guy who made Wild. He directed all seven episodes and his distinct way of editing sequences together is there. I thoroughly enjoyed this show, um, but it kind of falls apart for me at the end when it goes back to the murder mystery, which was so predictable who the, who the guy who got killed was. And then it ended with all of them on a beach, like, oh, female empowerment. I'm like, female empowerment? You fucking murdered a guy. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I, I just love these women. They're great characters. And the way they just, they, um, Laura Dern's character and Reese Witherspoon's character would, like, use their kids as pawns in their game to be the most popular woman on the block. It, it's awesome. American Gods, this is a weird fucking show. Mindhunter from David Fincher, he directed four episodes. Uh, my only complaint with this show is the first episode sucks. Once you get past that first episode, and I promise you, get past the first episode, the rest of it is phenomenal. From episode 2 to episode 10, it is almost perfect television. And then we got Mr. Robot, the holy grail of television. It's up there with Breaking Bad, it's up there with Game of Thrones for me. It is one of the best shows ever, okay? And I'm gonna do a video on Mr. Robot one day, I don't know when. I don't know where, but I will do it. So you, you're gonna have to wait to hear more from me. Go watch Mr. Robot ASAP, because it is, especially this season, was a 10 out of 10. Mm. Again, again, ready? Mwah. So now let's do all the worst movies. Starting at number 71, we got 9-11, which is the most offensive piece of fucking garbage I've ever seen. It's the complete opposite of Good Time, which was really concerned about being authentic to the people who lived in the city and like, the, the environments they were in. In this movie, they couldn't even get an elevator set that looked like an elevator in the World Trade Center. That's how little they gave a shit. The performances are god-awful, especially Charlie Sheen, who is a 9-11 truther, by the way. And he clearly did this as, like, an ego project. He wanted to, like, be an empower- He wanted to, like, empower himself by being, like, this dramatic, flawed character in this horrible situation, like Oscar bait. And he's so delusional that, of course, he thinks this is how he's gonna win an Oscar. But this movie's awful. Wish Upon, this movie's hilarious in basically every way. Um, if Red Letter Media doesn't do a review of this one, I'll do a review. The 69 is The Bye Bye Man, I reviewed this already. The Emoji Movie 68, that's coming up soon, don't worry. 67's Transformers The Last Night, I did a review of this already. Uh, we got Amityville Awakening, this movie was shelved for like 8 years or something, it was supposed to come out in like 1988. <laughs> okay, not maybe not that far, but it was supposed to come out like two, three years ago, and they kept pushing it back and doing reshoots, and now it's here, and it's awful. And Bella Thorne is the Daniel Day-Lewis of shitty acting. A uh, friend request, I don't know why they released this movie in theaters this year, I saw it, I saw it like early January before they released it in theaters, it got leaked online or something, I watched it that way, and I'm like, yeah, it, it sucked. Book of Henry, this is from the guy uh, Colin Trevorrow, who was going to direct Star Wars, um, now he's not, because this movie was so ungodly awful, they don't want him near a camera ever again. And neither do I, because this movie is so tone deaf and stupid, it's, it's baffling. I, I really do almost recommend this movie, because of how stupid it is. It goes from, like, this, this really poorly made, but okay, like, family movie, and then this kid gets a brain tumor and dies, and he leaves, like, all these messages, 
and then Naomi Watts is like sad that her kid died. But uh, uh, Book of Henry, the Book of Henry, it, it says like, "Mom, you need to kill Dean Norris or something." So go get a sniper rifle from the store <laughs> and just shoot Dean Norris while this while his daughter's at some recital. It's like, what the hell is going on? Kingsman Golden Circle. I reviewed this one as well. This movie is total shit, and I don't recommend it at all. Death Note is unbelievably bad. I have nothing to say about it. It is. I like some of the music in it, that's about it. Monster Trucks is stupid, sure, but it's like, it's made for kids. I guess if you're like an eight year old or... Triple X Return of Xander Cage was very disappointing. It was funny at first, there was like a scene where Vin Diesel skateboards on a bus sideways. It, like, that was awesome. But the rest of it, eh. A sleepless, best movie of the year. Um, aside from Chips. Uh, that's why it's number 59. I haven't even seen Chips, by the way. Oh, uh, Rings, it's 58. Movie sucked. Belko Experiment, this movie was boring as hell, and I wanted to see people use like office supplies to kill each other. I wanted to see someone stapled to death, but this movie was just like people bo being boring. Train to Busan, same thing. It's another zombie movie, literally just like the same. Oh, I have a daughter, and we're on a train, and there's zombies, and we're gonna leave the train, and there's more zombies, and we're gonna come back. It was just boring as hell. Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tale. The only redeeming aspect of this movie are some of the action sequences are kind of fun. Rest of it was total shit, including the writing, and the kid from Blue Lagoon was in it, and he was awful. Cure for Wellness, I was extremely disappointed by this movie. I think this movie looks gorgeous. Aside from that, the acting is awful, especially from Dane DeHaan, who is, you know, he's the Daniel Day-Lewis of shitty acting, along with Bella Thorne. And it's just, a, it's just an awful script and an awful story. Alien Covenant, I covered this movie in immense detail. Uh, number 52 is Atomic Blonde. This movie, I wanted John Wick, the female version. That's what I wanted. And what I got was a, a convoluted, boring story about Charlize Theron, who can't do a fucking accent to save her life. Uh, and they have this reveal at the end of the movie that she was American the whole time, just doing a bad uh, British accent. I think they just wrote that in at the end because they realized, like, oh my god, uh, Charlize can't act. The, the story is, is basically pretty simple, but they tell it in the most ridiculous, convoluted way. You can barely even keep track of what the hell's supposed to be happening. There's one really great action sequence in this movie, which makes up for most of it for me, right? But aside from that one action scene, which is probably on YouTube now, the rest of this movie is boring as hell, convoluted, horribly acted, terribly paced. And just bad. T2 train spotting is it's like we made the sequel cause whatever. And it's not nearly as good as Train Spotting 1. Not even close. Not even on the same plane of existence as Train Spotting 1. Wonder Woman, uh I talked about this movie in immense detail. Kong Skull Island, I found uh I, I like the fight scene at the end with the lizard, the big lizard and King Kong. Um, but that was about it. C characters sucked. Some neat visuals, I guess. Gerald's Game, I like, I think this movie's a solid five or six for most of it. Most of the acting here isn't great, but uh, Carly Gugina's pretty good, right? And this, there's this guy in it who's really creepy. He's the guy from Twin Peaks. But then the last 10 minutes of this movie is so awful, it kind of ruins the whole experience. Ghost Story, I like, it has some neat ideas and visually it's pretty nice, but I found most of it totally dull. And its message is like, yeah, whatever. When you die, uh, life goes on. Time goes on. Crazy, right? I didn't know that. This is when the movie really got bad for me. Because I thought most of it was, like, boring. But I'm like, alright, whatever. It's doing a thing, right? But then it gets to this scene, and there's just, just this hipster guy just explaining what the point of the movie is. Like, yeah, man, when we die, this life goes on, man. It's crazy, right? And he has smoking a joint. It's terrible. Uh, I get why people like it. I found it... It's, I thought it sucked. War for the Planet of the Apes. This is the Oscar-worthy film <laughs> that that everyone told me about. This movie stinks. <laughs> Andy Serkis is great, and the visual effects are fantastic. Aside from that, it's cliche as hell. Character things like, oh, this this ape is gonna give a flower to the girl. And I'm like, okay, this ape's gonna die in the next scene. And then, and then he does. And there's all kinds of stupid cliche shit like that. The girl character is awful and serves no point really aside from some thematic purpose this movie is like tone deaf because it goes from this like holocaust depressing movie 
And then it turns into this goofy, like, oh, we gotta escape the prison, and we're gonna throw shit at the guards to distract them. I wish I could go more in-depth, because I know a lot of people really like this movie, but, uh, for me, didn't work at all. I thought it stunk. And as if all that wasn't bad enough, there was a mentally handicapped person in the theater. Not his fault, obviously, but he kept singing songs during the movie, and I guess that kind of took me out of it, too. Just, I'm watching Caesar, and it's a very quiet movie, and then this guy goes like, Sweet Caroline, come to me! Uh, we got Jigsaw. I give it a 5 out of 10. This movie is awful. Awful, awful, awful. But it's so funny, and I went into the theater fucking high as hell, okay? And I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. You need to get stoned and watch it with your friends, like I did. And, like, at the end of the movie, right, we were just baked, so we just clapped. And we got the whole theater to clap. It was awesome. Fate of the Furious, much of the same, guilty pleasure, this movie's stupid as hell, but it does some really awesome stuff with cars that I really liked. I don't know why people think this movie's like worse than the other ones, I think it's one of the better ones, honestly. Darkest Hour, it's it, it's exactly what you think it is, whatever, uh, it's completely dull. I saw the movie a week ago and I barely remember anything about it. Gary Oldman's good though. American Made is like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> That's how I felt about it. It's an interesting story for the most part. I wish it was better directed. Uh, the, the shot composition in this movie and the lighting, I was like, what the hell? I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to make it look like a documentary. They completely failed. It just looks like garbage. I don't feel at home in this world anymore. Eh, <laughs> it was fine. Lady Macbeth, much of the same. I thought it was fine. I think the, the lead actress, Florence Pug, is good. Star Wars The Last Jedi, I'm very in the middle on this movie. I thought there were some scenes that were absolutely excellent, like the lightsaber throne room scene, which is easily gonna go down as one of the best scenes in Star Wars. And then you got shit like uh, Leia's resurrection scene, the, um, the, the casino planet, you got characters like Rose that serve, that, that are just like there to annoy me. Lego Batman the movie, this is when we start to get into good movies. Uh, Lego Batman the movie was decent for the most part. I don't think it's nearly as good as Lego Movie, but I thought it was a fun little take on Batman. And it's certainly more entertaining than anything DC has done in years. Split, a really effective, simple movie. James McAvoy's excellent. The direction and sound and music in this movie is excellent as well. Um, it was just, I found the story kind of stupid and all over the place. And it takes a more supernatural turn toward the end. And I really wished it had set up that that kind of tone toward the beginning, so it would be easier to digest that. But it just kind of comes out of nowhere, and you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't buy that. And all those dumb scenes of the the old woman going like, he has 25 different personalities. It, it was so dumb. Uh, Wind River. This is a a pretty standard crime action story. The end shootout is fantastic. Um, that really made the movie for me. The rest of it is, like, decent. I don't know why they set up any relationship with him and his son. Uh, Thor Ragnarok at number 35. This is a, uh, it's a Marvel movie. It's entertaining, it's funny, it looks great. Um, story is bland as hell. The villain is bland as hell. I mean, Cape Blanchett brings a little something to it, but not much. The Big Yield, I, I like this movie a lot. It's the second movie this year to involve someone poisoning someone else with mushrooms. It, it's really just about a bunch of horny women dealing with one man in a house. <laughs> and as that, I thought it was terrific. Free Fire, it's a gimmick movie. The whole movie is basically one shootout. And I couldn't help but feeling at the end of it that it needed something else. I mean, it's a fun idea to just have a whole movie that's a shootout. But it felt more like a great scene and a great movie, rather than just a, a movie. And if, if there had been like an hour of other stuff that built up to this scene, this, this movie, basically, then it could have been one of the best movies of the year. Oh well. Disaster Artist. Uh, I talked about this one in a Reel It In. Uh, Logan Lucky, this is a standard heist movie directed by Steven Soderbergh. The acting is great for the most part, and it's a clever little heist movie. Uh, the only real issue I have with it are some of the performances. Seth MacFarlane is awful, and Hilary Swank is awful as well. And they, they don't really need to be in the movie. I don't get why they're there. But Adam Driver's great. 
Channing Tatum's great. Um, there's Steven Soderbergh, such a good director. He throws in so many wonderful little moments that are either funny or interesting or clever. It's the story of how Ray Kroc fucked over two businessmen, the McDonald brothers. And um, it, it works, but it's a true story. And it's like, yeah, you told the true story well enough, but you did really nothing with it that, that made it stand out. Uh, Michael Keaton's good in it, though. Colossal, this is a wonderful little story about Anne Hathaway controlling a monster just by accident. Uh, the, the worst parts of this movie is when it tries to explain why the monster is there. There's this whole backstory as to why the monster appeared, and it's so, so, so stupid. And if it wasn't there, this movie would have been much better for it. Boy, you guys, a really good movie with some good performances. Anne Hathaway, I like Anne Hathaway. I don't know why people have a problem with her. I think Jason Sudeikis is great as well. For the most part, this movie works. Uh, Mudbound, this is a, a film by D. Rees. I thought this movie could have done without the narration completely. There's a lot of narrating in this movie. It's apparently based on a book, and you can tell, because there's lots of scenes of characters just explaining shit that they don't need to. You see characters doing things, and yet they feel the need to narrate it, and it's awful. And the first hour is so narration heavy, it kind of ruined the movie for me. But toward the second hour and, and after that, um, they kind of stop doing that and it just kind of becomes a good movie. The character interactions and the acting is all wonderful here. Uh, I really like the look of this movie as well. It could have used a little more subtlety and it could have been uh, could have gone completely without the narration. And it would have been up there in my top 20, maybe even top 10, who knows. Lost City of Z, this is a really slow, classic Lawrence of Arabia era exploration movie. It's extremely slow. Some may call it boring. I found it very interesting. And uh, Channing Tatum is... Channing Tatum. Sorry. Charlie Hunnam. Charlie Hunnam and Robert Pattinson's in this movie. That's right, I forgot. They are both terrific. Um, my boy Tom Holland from Spider-Man is in it. And he's good as well. I, Tanya, it's a true story. I think the director brought a lot of style and visual flair to the movie. It's a bit Scorsese-esque, not nearly as good though. Um, the performances here from everybody, Margot Robbie, uh, Sebastian Stan, Allison Janney, everyone is, everyone is terrific. And the story itself is a very interesting story. I think they could have done more to make Tanya Harding a less sympathetic person. Because from what I know about this event, one, people say she did it, and I think she admitted that she had something to do with it, or at least she knew about this event, and the movie portrays it as if she knew nothing about it. Like they were just going to pay $1,000 to hire two guys to mail something from a different state. Like you're going to pay $1,000 for that. How stupid do you think I am? And the, the ice skating scenes are really well done, but you can tell it's not Margot Robbie there. They put like a CG Margot Robbie over the skater's face and it doesn't look very good. We got Lady Bird at number 25. Uh, aside from some generic cliche uh, plot stuff, this movie is very well acted and really just hilarious. The, the pacing is beautiful and this movie is so short and sweet. You can't help but just enjoy it. And I did. I thought it was a wonderful little movie. Not one of the best of the year for me, but, you know, I would definitely watch it again. Then we have The Florida Project, which was so good. The movie's a little too long, that's one thing. But then the, the last two minutes of this movie kind of ruin it. So 95% of this movie's pretty good, and then you got the last two minutes, which are just god-awful. So, 7 out of 10 movie right there. Bada boom. All the money in the world. Uh, Christopher Plummer's great. Michelle Williams is great. The, the only thing that really ruined this movie for me was Mark Wahlberg. He can't act. I believe Mark Wahlberg as a character that's like a plumber or like an everyday working guy, like a cop. Uh, he plays like this super awesome spy in this movie, and you don't buy him at all. And he does his traditional like, Hey man, I'm Mark Wahlberg. I want to talk high pitch like this, man, you know, because I'm concerned, you know? He's passable through like most of his scenes, but, you know, the Mark Wahlberg bad acting just shines through in spades in some of these scenes. Damn good movie though, aside from that. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, full of great characters and heart. It's a little cheesy. I love the idea that Kurt Russell's a giant planet that had sex with every different species that exists. And like, I just love that idea. I love, I love the villains in this movie. That's my biggest complaint with Marvel movies is that I hate the villains. And I thought all three villains in this movie totally worked. You had the gold people, who are after the Guardians of the Galaxy, 
basically because they got their feelings hurt by Rocket Raccoon. Then you have um, uh, Taserface, <laughs> who's great, and then you have Kurt Russell, who's a wonderful character. And number 21 is Detroit, which is, uh, I like this movie a lot. I did a review of it, click it here. Um, the only reason I like it is because I'm an SJW scumbag. Because I like a movie about black people and police brutality. It's a good movie. The movie's not saying all cops are bad. It's saying like three of them were. Back then. Like, oh god. People were racist in 1967? Get over it. Holy shit. How many comments I got like, This movie is SJW propaganda. This movie's lies. Like just, it's a good movie. And it's really not that biased at all. <laughs> like, if you watch it, which most of you haven't, clearly, because, like, no one saw this movie. Because, for that reason. But it's a good movie. You check it out. Anyway. That's it. So. Um. Oh, wow. R now Ralph is a SJW scumbag. First, he gives John Wick 2 a higher review than, than frickin' War of the Planet of the Apes. He also gave Jigsaw a higher review than War of the Planet of the Apes, by the way. War of the Planet of the Apes, not as good as Jigsaw. Get out of here. Plus, he uses drugs. Drugs should be illegal. Th this SJW scumbag. Unsub Ralph the Movie Maker. I'm starting a hashtag right now. Hashtag Boycott Ralph. That's right. Hashtag Boycott Ralph. We're boycotting him. I'm tired of these SJW scumbags trying to get political with all these freaking movie reviews. Like, like I, I voted for Trump. Yeah, so what? So what? What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? What, what's he gonna do? What, the next Hitler? Of course he thinks of the next Hitler. He listens to fucking BuzzFeed and all this garbage, right? He goes to BuzzFeed.com, looks up Trump, and they're like, Trump did... I'm not gonna pay reparations. Right? What did I do? Huh? Hashtag boycott Ralph the movie maker. I'm unsubscribing to him right now. Ready? Ready? Bam. Bam. That's it. SJW bastard. I always gotta get political. Like the Golden Globes. Like all these women came out. Like, yeah. And I'm like, oh. Uh, oh, I also saw Happy Death Day while editing this video. It was a piece of shit.